<laughs> hey guys, welcome to the 16th episode of Edu All Stars. Uh, my name is Todd Nesloni. On Twitter, you can find me at Tech Ninja Todd. Yeah, my name is Chris Kessler. You can find me at I am Kessler on Twitter. And I'm excited to say that today with us we have Kevin Honeycutt. Uh, Kevin is kind of like a jack of all trades in the educational world. He is currently a technology integration specialist at ESDAC in Kansas. He travels around the world speaking, hosts a creative learning site, is an Apple Distinguished Educator, writes blogs, hosts podcasts, has co-developed a PBL approach called the Life Practice Model, and has even created a film program for kids. He's passionate about meeting the needs of at-risk learners and works with kids in juvenile detention and developing approaches to re-engage the lost learner. Kevin, thanks for being with us here tonight. Do you want to go ahead and just give us your name and Twitter handle? Oh, okay. Um, I should have it in there, shouldn't I, in the title. Um, but my Twitter handle is Kevin Honeycutt, one word, H-O-N-E-Y-C-U-T-T. -T. Should I just put that? Where do I put that in? I hey, probably should have done that before I started. That's all right. You gotta <laughs> you gotta open the Hangout toolbox and then uh, uh, click on the lower third from there. I think you gotta. It's it's new, so you have to uh, allow some things to happen before. Well, I gotta say, Kevin, you have been on my list of guests that I've wanted since our first episode. So I am excited that we are finally getting to chat with you on the show, um, and that <laughs> we got to work it all out in our schedules and everything. So thank you for being on with us tonight. Yeah, cool. I was looking forward to it. Okay, definitely. Let's get started. So we always like to kind of get a little background about our guests before we get going. Just and, and basically, the question I like to ask is, how did you end up in the field of education? Was it something you've always planned on doing, or did you kind of <laughs> wind up here like me? <laughs> yeah, how does everyone answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I was the kid that said, never, I'll never be a teacher. I mean, um, I think it's one of those pay-it-forward things that occurs to you after a while. When you start realizing how much you owe the teachers you had. Because um, I'm not a second generation teacher, you know, so it's not like I saw mom or dad do it. Um, my mom was a janitor, so I, I was around school a lot. Um, you know, I think I was part of the school fabric. I guess I got comfortable with teachers that way. Um, I guess I came to teaching accidentally. Um, I got this little gig teaching art part time at an at arts council there in Ottawa, and uh, and I didn't know how to teach, so I just acted. Um, I just put all these characters, and the kids were mesmerized by my my stuff. And the teachers would say, "You can't keep that up for a career." Um, but I kind of did. Um, <laughs> but uh, I thought of teaching as like six shows a day, basically. Um, so I guess I was a sage on the stage in that way. But uh, I guess the thing I cared most about is getting every kid really engaged, um, really excited about art. Um, and then I didn't know it was going to become a career. Um, I think at the very end, after I paid for a lot of college, I thought, wow, I probably need a job. And so <laughs> I, I flipped a coin, literally flipped a coin between theater and art, and uh, art won, so I, I decided to teach art. But that's kind of like uh, not the most exciting story in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now you're working at ESDAC, though. So for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with ESDAC, can you tell us a little bit about it and kind of what you do there? Yeah, but every state in the country has educational service agencies. They're called different things in different places, but it amounts to the same thing. They're staff development centers. Uh, Kansas has five of these centers, where teachers come to get continuing ed credit and staff development. Uh, the unique thing, I think, about our state is that our, our staff development centers are unfunded, so we have to be entrepreneurial. Um, so when we get a job here, we have to come up with services that people will pay for, or we don't have a job very long. So I like that, actually. It means we really got to focus on what schools need and uh, what they should need, <laughs> and then teach them how to want it. You know what I mean? Um, so I like the way we we work here. I work with a whole bunch of other just really amazing people here. Uh, I would call them refugees from the system. They um, they're talented people that sort of we find and collect, and uh, they go out and do all kinds of different training and staff development in lots of areas. So I'm one person in a hive of excellence, I would say, who just happened to. Um, cast my shingle a little farther out into the world um, than Kansas and, and I, because I knew I had to. Who's going to come to an, uh, enough art workshops to keep my job? <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Even with technology integration, Central Kansas, you know, you run out of schools pretty fast. Yeah. I, I've trained everyone, so, <laughs> you know, I started using social media to, to, to get known a little farther. I got a podcast pretty quick in the early days of that. I had a podcast called Driving Questions in Education that was number one in, in, in video K-12 
for at least a year. Um, wow. And I Congrats. leveraged interviews like this. Um, uh, you know, when you interview someone, you ask them what they want to be asked. They tell everyone to watch your podcast, and I basically <laughs> stole everyone's audience until I was number one. So <laughs> you guys are on the right track here. Um, there you go. Um, I did mine from my car. It was called Driving Questions on Purpose because my job was to drive everywhere and to stay awake. I started talking to myself and recording it. Now that's all. Um, and uh, and then I started interviewing people, authors like Daniel Pink, when his book first came out, um, A Whole New Mind, and um, the audacity to even ask. But people kept saying yes, so I kept I kept doing it. Um, and then I had some problems. I had a, I had a, a crash of my hard drive. And I lost my um, my podcast, and I couldn't get oh. Apple to answer my email t to help me reestablish my RSS feed, and so I lost my position from from one to nothing. And uh, it, I kind of got mad about it. I thought, "Darn it, <laughs> help me out here!" <laughs> yeah. And so I jumped over to YouTube, and I haven't looked back. Um, I I still have a new podcast coming out pretty soon. I still like podcasting, but I just I don't know. I'd done a few years of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was ready to try something new. So to me, the immediacy of YouTube and going from my phone straight to YouTube, I just wish I could publish to YouTube and my podcast and everything, and I probably can all at the same time. If someone wants to help me figure that out in the course yeah. of my crazy life. Um, <laughs> do that. But I'm going to leave it to you, young Jedis, to take the mantle from here and, and let an old Yoda like myself, um, you know, <laughs> head off and or something new. Go yeah. back to Dagobah, man, and make myself some food. You know, That's every, right. <laughs> You know, you had mentioned something a second ago about, uh, you know, it never hurts to ask and people just kept saying yes. We've run into that same thing when we just think, it seems like everyone we ask really is intrigued and wants to do it. I mean, I don't think we've been told, but just a couple of times, you know, told no just a couple of times, but everyone seems real interested, even, you know, people that well, we would never honest. in a million years talk to. So let's be honest, young Jedis. Um, that's not an accident. You call your podcast Edu All Stars. Yeah. Who doesn't want to be on that? <laughs> that's a good point. That's kind of smart. That, that's okay? why we got Arnie. Call it biggest loser. Energy. You know. <laughs> the biggest loser. <laughs> There's a certain we, amount of ego. We, we you know, didn't want. Yeah. Loser. We didn't want people to think that we were the Edu All Stars. So, yeah. I think at first people were like, "Who are these three jokers?" You know, calling themselves <laughs> Ed. And we're like, "No, you're the Edu All Stars." But this weird thing happens. You gain authority uh, over time. You talk across the table to enough sort of experts that before long you're perceived as an expert. I mean, that's just what you do. I teach kids this. Yeah. If you talk to enough experts, you become expert in time, and you take their audience a little at a time as they talk about going to see your your podcast. Um, that's a strategy. Then you learn what to say from all these great people. Before long, you you pretty much know what to say. Um, mm -hmm. I, for me, I'm not Mensa smart. It took years. Um, other people <laughs> might be take months. So uh, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah, definitely appreciate it. So, is there someone that kind of inspired you along the way to what you're kind of doing now? You know, as where you're not in the classroom anymore and those kinds of things. Anyone that stands out in your mind? It's hard. Um, this leaving the classroom thing. It's always been hard for me. Today I spent the whole day talking to kids uh, third grade through twelfth grade in Halstead, Kansas uh, in, in an auditorium a few hundred at a time. I was teaching all day today. I still get to do that uh, but I, I present and I talk to kids and I infotain and you know I do what I did and I, I do it enough to get it out of my system but I love the classroom. I absolutely loved my classroom. It was my petri dish. Um, I taught K-12 art and I did theater, and I coached football some. I should never have been allowed to coach football. I didn't know how <laughs> football worked, but we still had two winning seasons, so hey. Hey, there you go. You did something um, right. You know, they just figured I'm a guy. I should do, I should do football, but, you know, <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> um, the kids protected me. I would call in a play, and it would be wrong, and one of my eighth graders would go, no, no, no. <laughs> so i call in another play, and he'd go, no, no, and i call in a third play, and he'd go, yeah. So basically, <laughs> my kids <laughs> called the plays. Because I didn't even know what I was calling. Um, but every kid played, you know, and uh, I don't know. It's kind of funny. In a small town, you get to do a little bit of everything. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, leaving the classroom wasn't easy. I actually left the classroom without a job. Um, I didn't have this job. Wow. I was doing some things that I thought were pretty innovative, uh, not because I was trying to do innovative things. I was trying to do engaging things and things that would get my program noticed so that it, it would never be on the chopping block for funding reductions and things like that. So I was doing a headline thing at least once a year, more out of survival than showing off. Um, but the more I did,
Chris, you there? Did we lose uh, him? Remember yeah, now, this there. this was oh, there he is. this was ten years ago. This was uh, thirteen years ago. I mean, uh, they say most good school innovation dies of domestic violence. Um, you know, in a small town, and it's not no one's fault. It's not on purpose. But when you do things different, and they scare people, and they're afraid they're going to have to do it next. Um, that's scary to people, and I think I just I pushed too far too fast, and I couldn't go back because I knew it was good stuff, and I knew the kids liked it, and it was it was what I needed to do. So uh, I don't know. I just one day in my class, I remember sitting there at lunch by myself and thinking I don't have any friends, and I'm lonely, and my kids are my only friends, and that's not where I want to be. And so I I quit and started painting houses, and then this place called me. And they had noticed me for years um, and couldn't offer me a job until I quit. <laughs> I thought, great. Oh, wow, cool. <laughs> Fine. Wow, perfect timing. Yeah. They hired me for exactly what got me in trouble um, back hilarious. then. And I've been doing staff development based on those things um, and talking about those things uh, for 10 years now. And I'm still a school board member in that town where I used to teach, uh, third term. And That's I love my town. I would tell you this, Inman schools are rocking it now. Um, we're an Apple Distinguished Program at the high school, one-to-one uh, -one iPads. The district is just uh, amazing. I mean, the elementary is great. We're, we're probably better than we've ever been, um, and I think we are where I, I wanted us to be back then, but now the whole community is there, and a lot of that is administration. A lot of that is it took time to change the culture. You know, it, innovation moves at human speed. You know, right. at the end of the day, and you can vilify people for that, but I don't think that's fair. I think, um, I think your strategy helps. You know, at the leadership level. You know, I'm a big fan of of indoctrinating all of your young Jedi's who are pushing it, and your, by the way, gray-haired Jedi's, <laughs> your, your Yodas and your Obi Wan's. They're out there, but they're yeah, often they forgotten are. as we grab these young, right out of college folks. And I'll tell you this: some of those, uh, some of those older Jedi's, um, they know a lot. Right, and right. they have authority, and they have a tenure, and if they're on your side, uh, they can really help you a whole lot. So I think a smart person builds a big team, a petri dish team, a magnificent seven uh, of you know innovators who who bring new ideas to staff development. And without that, you don't have a petri dish, and you don't have a hope of getting better or changing. So I'm preaching that. You know, I get paid to preach that now. I can't believe it. Sometimes I can't believe. Uh, what's going on in my life? <laughs> Do you, Would you actually ever consider going back in the classroom? Every day, actually. Really? Every day. Um, it's hard not to. In fact, this tomorrow I'll be in the classroom teaching. In the morning I'll be teaching uh, K through K through four, and we'll be making solar cookers and cooking hot dogs. And then in the afternoon I'll be working with five eight, and they'll be inventing solar cookers, um, problem solving, and trying to so prove cool. that their solar cookers better. Um, so I still do that. Once a month I'm in a school where I am I get to drive and they let me work with all the kids and, and then I do pro bono work in all kinds of places. Well so we need to get you down to Texas obviously because I know well, just hearing you talk now, I want I want my I want you to come do this with some of my kids. And I know Chris right down the road from me, he'd want you to do it too. Absolutely. If you, if you look at um you know, when I got here I'd been doing staff I'd been doing project based learning for my whole career maybe 26 years of, of, of summers and uh, school years uh, building things with kids um, that, ha that cast them in a role as architect, archaeologist, inventor, innovator. They were never cast in the role as student. They were always something more important. A student is kind of hypothetical for some kids. Not every kid knows why they should be a student, but if you make them something important and let them be heroic and get them finished and get them to hold it in their hands and say, look what I made, that's that whole maker's movement. Well, crap, I was doing that stuff, you know, in 81, 82, 83. Um, I believed in this for a long time, that kids should create. Now, guess what's at the very top of Revised Blooms? Mm -hmm. Create. Yeah, create. Yeah. How fun that is. So yeah. now I think that the planets have aligned. Um, so when I go out to a school, I want, us, I want us to create something, make something that we can be proud of, and do it in a day. Not a week, not a month, a day, sometimes an hour. Mm -hmm. um, just to show them they can and bring the community in and show them what it looks like when their kids are totally engaged and learning. I want headlines. Um, I want to protect that so people will want more and more and more of that, not passive sitting, waiting for permission to pee, um, but actually activated spark plug kids who are like changing the world, you know? Right. So let's talk about uh, this life practice model uh, you developed with Ginger uh, Lumen. 
Uh-huh. Can you tell, yep. can you just tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, gosh, how many years ago was it now? Seven, eight. Uh, our my service unit here was partnering with the Emporia School District to build a charter school. So we basically had it outsourced to us, and I was sort of at the front of that, and got to interview the teachers uh, that we were going to hire. And we interviewed Ginger. She was uh, to be a lead teacher, basically functioned like a principal, on a shoestring budget, um, and then hire a workforce full of zealot teachers. And I'm talking zealot teachers, not nine to fivers. I'm talking people that are real willing to work on a school like it's a startup business. I mean, pour their heart and soul into it. And I, you can't go wrong when you have those kind of people. Right. Um, people who can't wait to get out the door and knock the kids over to get out to their car at 3:15. I don't want them on my staff. Um, you know, and so hired her, and she's absolutely nuts and just as damaged as I am, <laughs> and perfect actually, because she's a she's a crazy learner. I mean, she's she's a firecracker. <laughs> I've met her too. She comes from gifted. I come from at risk, and so together we're Sunny and Share, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, of of uh, you know staff. I said, let's treat them all like they're gifted and see what happens. Um, and we had about fifty fifty at risk versus uh, of gifted. And it was amazing uh, how it worked. And then we started building this model we call the life practice model. And this was because I had this notion that school should be literal life practice. Kids should be practicing for life because if we didn't have school and everyone raised their own kids, that's what we would do. That's what every animal does. They rehearse life until the offspring is ready to start life. But my contention was that through behaviorist design, we did not do that anymore. We created hypothetical constructs, and we—if we were rabbits, this is how we'd be teaching. We'd be down in the rabbit hole, showing them pictures of blades of grass when real blades of grass were right up there. Mm -hmm. You know. So I thought we need to bring the world into this school. Let the kids function like they're really in the world. Rehearse the skills they're going to need immediately when they leave here. Don't, you know? And Ginger was totally on board with that. We've always agreed on, on those precepts. So we started building all of these these lessons that were designed to just grab kids. I mean, totally grab, engaging lessons. Um, I'll give you some for instance. Doomsday 1, the kids have either an hour or a day or a week, depends on how you design it, to stop a killer asteroid from destroying the Earth. They know about the D1 asteroid. They have all kinds of facts. It's going to liquefy the surface of the Earth. It's moving at 35,000 miles per hour. They have to collaborate with outside experts and come up with a plan to save the world and make a video for the UN Secretary General um, <laughs> you know, and, and then prove that an outside expert said their plan had a and chance what age is this? I, I've done this all the way down to... I was going to huh? say, what age were you doing this with? I've done this down to third wow. grade, all the way up to high school. And that's what we designed these to go all the way up and all the way down, up to the teachers to tune it. But we get these literal teachers that they want to know exactly what to do. Tell me exactly what to do. Are you freaking kidding me? I don't yeah. even know your kids yet. You know exactly what to do. If you'll trust yourself, be prescriptive. What are the kids where you are need to be engaged? How do you want to launch that lesson? I, I do it with a sort of a presidential briefing, and they all come into a briefing room, and I tell them all, Godspeed, mm -hmm. go save the world, literally. And, you know, they're on fire. Now, what are we learning? <laughs> you decide. Space science, physics, problem solving, math and measurement, you name it. The creative teacher, it's up to you to not stop the lesson and lecture. For God's sake, wait for them to want to know and pollinate that flower right then. It's exhausting because you've got to run around a lot. Sorry, that's the job. Mm. But the kids know exactly why math, exactly why science. It has perfect context. You know, They know why. All these lessons are designed around an anchoring artifact. It's so compelling they'll stay after school to work on it. Um, that was the whole idea is to hook them and cook them. What, what about a teacher that comes to you and says, we just don't have time. we got to teach to these standards. There's, there's just no time for that kind of stuff because I hear that I a lot. I say when bacteria was discovered, they told doctors to wash their hands between patients during the war, and some of them said, I don't have time to wash my hands. I'm too busy saving patients, and they killed a lot of patients. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing I would say, being like snarky. That. And second, <laughs> I would say, you know, how much of what you learned in school do you remember? It makes people laugh, actually. How many chalkboards full of stuff did you write down that you don't remember? And if you don't remember it, did you learn it anyway? So if, if you want to pretend we're learning and pass the assessments and go ahead and fail the kids, um, we can keep doing what we're doing. Now, Common Core has given us a little breathing room. Now, I want us to grab Common Core and make it ours, not to wait around for someone to tell us how to do it. The theory is we're going to take fewer things and go deeper. Hey, I'm all over that. I'm all over that. I'd rather go deeper and have you remember something than have you kind of remember 
twice as much and We lost him again. Yeah, lost you. I Kevin. lost you for a second there. Yeah, there we you are. are. We're good. We're What's good. the last thing you heard? You want to get him? <laughs> you want to grab him? Yeah, I was on fire there, man. I was preaching. <laughs> I know that's. I know. It goes out right <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> there, um, I believe that emotion is essential for learning. That emotion actually cements learning, and without emotion, learning doesn't really happen. And I think boredom isn't the emotion we're looking for. I think excitement, I, I, I think, you know, uh, happiness. Um, sadly, it's, it, a lot of times it's nervousness and pressure, you know, and it makes kids remember the things they're learning in a very unhappy way, you know. Right. It, clouds, it, it, it clouds the whole thing because they know we're doing assessments. They know the teacher's job is on the line. They know the school is on the line. That's a lot of pressure for a grade school kid or special needs kids who knows that they're being vilified because their grades are ruining the school's ability to make AYP. I think right. criminal things have happened, you know, and I feel bad about that. Um, I don't want a teacher to lose their job, but the good teachers have never stopped doing good stuff, even against right. all of that pressure. Yeah. Thank God. I just want us to now reignite, reignite that ability for a teacher to be creative, to be a cook in the kitchen with new spices, and stop making hamburger helper. <laughs> Well, you're talking about creativity and creating. I know one of the things that you've also started is a film program for kids. What, what's, what's that about? You know, when we first started that, I was just looking to save the school play. So I decided to do a movie, um, and tons of kids tried out because it was a movie. It, it was the worst movie you've ever seen. Um, <laughs> at a VHS camera, one computer with 64 megs of RAM. Um, I knew nothing, man. I, I crashed the thing twice and lost 80 hours of work during the process. Uh. But we got it off the ground, and the, the media came out. The kids got to walk down a red carpet and get out of a limo, and it was a big, big, big deal. And on the heels of that, I, I realized that you know, it was a cult of personality teacher program where it was all about me, and if I died in a car wreck, the program would be over. So I spent a summer uh, designing a VE2-funded career tech ed-focused uh, film program. So kids can make local commercials, um, PSAs, documentary films uh, through the year, and we'd have um, kind of a film festival in the spring, and t and parents would fill out ballots, you know, with voting, and kids would win, you know, Oscars. Our Oscars were bowling trophies um, <laughs> that had the arms broken off of them um, <laughs> to save money. You know, we didn't have any money, um, and. Uh, you know, that's kind of where I wanted to take it so that kids were driving. The first wave is always teacher-driven. And then hopefully teachers give it away really fast. You know, when smart boards first came out, it was a teacher tool. And the good teachers quickly made it a, a kid tool, you know. Um, right. So that's kind of what I wanted to do. Since I left uh, the school, though, no one kept the program going. And that's the problem. If the culture doesn't fall in love with something and absolutely demand it, it stay, it leaves with a good teacher. Um, and I want it back because I, I think video is one of the po most powerful things you can teach with. I think it, video is the closest technology we've ever invented to the way the mind actually experiences the world. That's why it's so compelling. It's temporal, you know. Yeah. To, to see kids watch video and create with video is just it's just unbelievable. There's not a, a kid out there that doesn't like doing that. I mean, there's not a kid out there that doesn't like filming and, and creating with video. It's just ama it's an amazing tool. I think you can say kid, but I think you can say adult too. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Who doesn't? Yeah, exactly. It's, re it's, re it's rewindable life, is what mm. it is. And, and think about it. You and I learn in a temporal manner. We're designed to learn in a temporal manner. That means over time, in a story, a rewindable story that I can retell. And that's the only stuff we remember. Disparate facts given to us, but not thread together, don't stick. So video itself is temporal. It plays out over time, much like the way we encode information. If I asked you what you did on your last vacation, uh, fill out this bubble test, you would be okay. You'd, you'd do okay. But if I said, tell me the story of your last vacation, you would do much, much better because that's how the stuff is encoded. Uh, but in school, if we're not doing things that's worthy of a story, you know, interesting teachers are stories in themselves. That's why they're so compelling and kids remember them. Interesting classroom experiences, experiments, uh, field trips. Those are all really cool stories. Sitting in the same desk every day hearing wonk, 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 wonk while you have teaching done to you is not a story that's easy to remember, no matter what happened, you know. That's why right. kids come home from school and you ask them what they did at school and they say nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to be. I don't mean to be. Uh, no, that's the way it is. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so you have a, a site called Art Snacks. What is what is that about? Um, six years ago, um, I was being called out to talk about online safety and to tell kids that Facebook was evil, um, and that bothered me because I didn't think Facebook was evil. Um, I thought Facebook was like a playground with no one on recess duty. Um, so I decided to build my own playground. So I started this network on Ning, populated it with 135 10-minute drawing videos that I made over the summer, flipped my classroom six years ago, um, and uh, started inviting teachers first and populated it with hundreds of teachers. Then I started inviting kids. You have to be 14 to have an account there. Um, and but a classroom teacher can use art snacks in their class to have kids draw with them. This is not fine art. I'm not pretending to be Juilliard. This is Bob Ross on a budget. <laughs> um, this is step by step, but when kids draw with me, I teach them in their ear the things that go with the drawing. So simple machines, yes, um, 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 layers of the earth, um, the solar system, um, national symbols. Um, I have a lot of those things like that, Conestoga Wagon, the Prairie Schooner, the Human Brain. Um, art teachers have been teaching everything for a very long time. Uh, we just don't get credit for it very often. Yeah. If you draw a fire ant, I'm going to say head, abdomen, thorax, exoskeleton, insects, six legs, Trojan horse style. I'm trying to get a, you a second bite at that apple and to get you to learn. So anyway, I've been doing that for a long time. We're, we're past 10,000 members now. Wow. Um, and I learn a lot from watching behaviors on this network. Kids are not mean to each other on Art Snacks, but I ask them not to be, simply. And they rise to that occasion you know and there's a lot of mentors on there who help just because they do I mean there's some wonderful people on that network who just uh, they go in and say nice things about kids work I mean I can build kids up I can say nice job can't wait to see your next drawing whenever I do that the kid posts three more drawings that same day and I can tell they were starving for just a little feedback but there are poets on there there are writers on there there are science kids on there math kids not just art arts the hub but it's really you know anything I guess and a lot of uh, a lot of kids make friends over there um, my hope is that someday kids are being scouted for scholarships there I've been working on that since day one trying to get colleges to see that there's thousands of kids sitting there every day and that they should be going after them and trying to get them into their colleges so if you got any pull with anyone <laughs> always looking to make that happen <clears throat> Well, it seems that the arts are something that you are really passionate about has that always been the case with you? I think so and I think it's because I wasn't a traditional learner. I was emotionally compromised and struggled. Um, mm -hmm. But whenever I was allowed to do it creatively, I nailed it every time. It just almost never happened. But when it did happen, I stayed up late and worked twice as long on things if I could just have a little input into how I did it. Like, for instance, I'm talking to you right now. Um, for years, I was a terrible writer, but an amazing talker. I'm not bragging, but I, I talk pretty well. Because I think a lot of kids in poverty have to. It's a coping mechanism. Talking is writing with your mouth, if we would honor that. But if you make me put a pencil on paper, and this is the only way you're going to grade me, I'm going to fail. But if you would let me use speech to text, I'll spell check. I promise I will. <laughs> but I can have three paragraphs in no time, and my story will be the best one in class if you'll just honor what I'm good at. Right. Do we all have to come through the same keyhole? Or can some kids come in a different way? You know, we talk about differentiated instruction. Now we have all these technologies and all these apps. Now we can, we can make things better. We can be prescriptive with how we let kids show us they're smart. But some people are going to they're gonna vilify that. They're going to say, that's cheating. That's cheating. That's just cheating. They're going to say that. And these are people who were good at school, by the way. So how nice for you that you think I'm cheating. You know, is the wheelchair ramp cheating? These kids need another way. You know what I mean? Right. And as long as you're fighting to keep us all exactly the same, we're stuck. So I'm saying to people like you and everywhere I go, you better be an advocate for giving kids flexibility. Right. You have to. You have to stand up for it and say, this is why we do this. Uh, he's coming at learning in a different way, but you wait and see where he is by the time we're done. <clears throat> yeah, um, <clears throat> I've had a lot of success with menu projects in my class. The kids just loved them. And they're, and they're given a choice to do a project, that, you know, a certain you know different kinds of ways and it's they always pick one not picking one is not an option and they never say I'm not doing anything it's like no I want to do this it, it, that's the coolest part about it is that sometimes you give a project that's all the same and they they choose to not do it but in this case it's like 
they're kind of tricked into they they just pick one because they that because they know how to rap or they know how to write or they know how to build something mm -hmm. and that and that's what they're good at and that's uh, those yeah the student centered menu projects I just had a really lot of success with those. So you need if you haven't shared that so yeah we just lost you. we lost you again Kevin <laughs> and he'll be back in just a second. <laughs> okay, what's the last thing you heard? Yeah, if you haven't shared, that's all I heard. Yeah, then I want you to do that so people can download and try that. The idea yeah. that kids have choice. If you think about what we are as organisms, we're designed to have choice. We're designed to be uh, constantly navigating a constantly changing environment and to do well within that and to learn as we go. Put into an environment that stays the same every day and given very few choices is the opposite of what we're designed to do well. Right. You know? Um, I think of it as incarceration, uh, dancing in a straitjacket. Um, you know, and a lot of people felt like me, like uh, we almost couldn't sit still. And if you read Brain Rules, you know Medina's book, um, it will give you a lot of uh, armament uh, to make the case that kids need to be in motion. They need to have choices. That you know, this brain needs that. I would say if if you can survive school and not do that and be indoctrinated and wait for permission to think. I think you're damaged by the time you're done. Yeah, um, yeah teaching is non-invasive brain surgery, and right. we're doing harm. <laughs> so you kind of already mentioned that you're on, still on the school board out in the district you were in, but what what was it kind of like work? You know, coming from the classroom and now serving on a totally different side of the educational world. You know, world. You mean as a school board member, or as yeah, a staff uh -huh. member? Yep. School board member. Mm -hmm. Yes. Actually, I love it um, because I love teachers, and um, I feel like I can advocate. And there's a lot of misunderstanding. Think about American school boards. No one has to have a degree. No one has to have an education background. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about what education is. A lot of people will compare it to business. In my business, we do this. And uh, it bothers me because kids are not widgets. Uh, kids are people. Uh, it's not you know, a perfect comparison. And I like to be there to say, no, 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 this is what really happens. This is probably, I can advocate. That's not to make excuses. That's to help them make decisions based on what really happens in classrooms. You know, in a K-3 classroom, <laughs> the first nine weeks is just routines, <laughs> learning routines, getting in line before you pee your pants. It's a, it's a little simpler <laughs> than what people think. I mean, you just got to get routines down. And you don't bury teachers in a million expectations until they've built relationships with their kids and trust. Right. You have to be a teacher to know that. You have to have seen that to know that, you know, or you can damage things. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of input in education that don't know how it really works. And I, I think that's a problem. I, I, legislators, you know, pass these 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 unfunded mandates um, and tell us how to teach. And this bothers me because a lot of us complain about that. I got mad the other day at a meeting and said, stop complaining and start advocating for what we should be doing. Stop worrying what people are doing to us and get loud on behalf of your children. You know what the right thing is. Don't let people invent new assessments for Common Core without our opinion. Don't let that happen. You know, an, in my opinion, an assessment shouldn't be a separate activity. The assessment should be the learning that we do. And by doing that learning, the assessment should be over. That kid should show me everything I need to see through that lesson. And by the end, it is the assessment, if we trust teachers. Right. If we don't, we need a second assessment because we got, you know, we got to show them. We got to be the wise father and make sure those teachers are doing the right. We got to keep them accountable because you know teachers are in this for the money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm tired of get t teachers getting beat up by politicians who make I don't know how much money, how much the yeah. teachers make. This is not a career. <clears throat> not this enough. is a calling. This is yeah. a freaking calling. And how nice of you to attack teachers who have nothing, who went to college how many years to make how much money? I'm tired of being a target, and I'm tired of teachers being a target. I want us to talk louder, to tell our stories better, to share our student success stories, and to make ourselves unassailable so no one wants to attack these stories. No one. Does that sound crazy? No. no not at all. <laughs> I completely agree with you. <laughs> We're humble. Teachers Sounds are like humble. You may, you may get arrested, though, if you keep that up <laughs> in a public forum, yeah. <laughs> I got a movement, baby. I got so many Twitter followers now. Bring it that's on. Right, that's, that's right. right. That's I'm right. I'm starting a movement. You know, I want to start a movement, <laughs> not unlike the 60s, except with a purpose, you know, a, a stronger purpose. Uh, and if the purpose of getting kids ready for their future isn't a good one, then what is? Right. You know? Yeah. And if we can't be brave on behalf of kids, where will we be brave? Right. 
So tell us more about working with the kids in the juvenile detention centers that you do and, and kind of how did that come about? When did that become a passion of yours? Is something you had mentioned you kind of came, I don't, you didn't really say it came from that background, but you didn't come from the GT side of it. You came from that risk side of it. So uh, kind of just talk through that. It's one of those, um, could have been me, almost was me, um, and I knew those people uh, as a kid. Um, and I worked with a lot of at-risk kids who just sort of, they find you because they know you're a weirdo. Um, you know, they find their likes, I don't know. But ESDEC got a contract to work with um, with this juvenile detention center here in my town. And then different ones of us were asked if we wanted to go out. And uh, I volunteered and, and uh, was going to go teach art. And uh, man, that was a wake-up call. Um, and I'd taught in some weird places before, but juvie lockdown, man. I mean, it's locked down. Uh, you yeah. get in there. They take my pencils away. I got to teach art. They take my pencils. Um, I got paper. Um, <laughs> they give me gummy pencils. Um, I liken it to drawing with an earthworm. Um, oh my gosh! So they're okay. Now walk into a teaching environment where you have no technology. You've got angry kids, and you've got rubber pencils, um, and you have one hour. I really dig this. <laughs> It's like the octagon of teaching. <laughs> yeah, you know right. what I mean. Uh, if you can, <laughs> if you can do this, uh, you can teach anywhere. And I like to see if I still have my chops. And my chops really are um, relationships. I'm really good at establishing relationships and trust quickly, um, because Juvie will do that. But really, Juvie is exactly like staff development. Um, a room full of people who don't want to be there, and one of them may shank you in front of everyone. It's really the same environment. So I've had 10 years of that, so I can handle juvie. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it really taught me a lot. Um, and every time I go in, it's different. And every time I go in, it's scary. And every time I come out, my heart's full. Um, these kids made mistakes. They have right. time. And while they have time, they can get better at something. Um, I don't know. I think everyone should do that once. Just do, they, <clears throat> do they appreciate you being there? The kids or the guards? Yeah, the kids. Um, yeah. I mean, at first, you know, I've got the ones who... It's the recidivists that help me. Uh, it's sad. I should never see a kid twice because, hypothetically, they should be adjudicated and go back home. Mm -hmm. But so many of them are recidivists that <laughs> I see them every time I go in. Yeah. It's me yeah. trying to do it. Thank God. <laughs> otherwise, I'd be, I'd be meeting them new every single time. So yeah. I hate to lean on recidivists, but it, it helps. Um, but quickly I have to build a trust relationship and I find that a lot of people who go into juvie uh, just they're adversarial with the kids they beat them into submission uh, even though that didn't work already um, and the different guards have different approaches I like this one female guard in there that that she she commands a certain respect because she gives respect when she's there I love teaching there because she, the environments not not adversarial you know not right. gotcha not turn his back and we'll do some stupid thing. Um, there's a trust there, and you know it's hard. These kids have been in hard places. I want to give them one hour of success. So we do three art snacks drawings because I can do three in an hour, um, and then I'll say, "How many of you just drew the best rabbit of your life?" And every hand goes up. How does it feel to do something the best you ever did it? How about three times in one hour? I know it's Bob Ross. I don't have much time. I'd like to do fine art. <laughs> I, you know, I have rubber pencils, um, so yeah. I do the best I can. Um, what, it, what it taught me was that flipping my classroom um, freed me up to team teach with myself. Mm -hmm. Archive Kevin is teaching the lesson, and this Kevin is walking around building relationships. Uh, it made two of me. So I was sold on this years ago, this idea of team teaching with myself and, and, and uh, flipping my classroom and making myself rewindable. Right. Um, so Art Snacks served me very well in there. I, I didn't get to take my computer till maybe the third visit because I had to get the guards to trust me that I could control. And it wasn't a matter of control. It was a matter of trust. I got the kids to trust me, and then they, I, I could trust them. And within reason, of course. One could stab you any second. They could shank you. Um, I'm not a freshman in all of this. Um, right. But most of them are going to have your back if you get if you connect with them. So I guess it's the extreme home edition of respect and uh, relationships. So I like it. I, I don't get to do it as much as I would like to. And whenever I'm home long enough and, and it works out, I like to go in there. I, I also seek out other at-risk programs uh, because those are my people. Um, yeah. I'm more comfortable with a big room full of angry kids than I am a big room full of administrators. 
Well, well switching, switching gears just a little bit, um, a common friend that we have with you um, are these two guys in Michigan named Brad and Drew. And uh, when I was talking to them about uh, you coming on the show, they were telling me all about this new toy robot that you have. And so I kind of I, I, I want to know about this. What is this? Gosh, I wish I had it with me right now. Um, if you Google, you people watching, double. <laughs> he always breaks out at the it's moment. The, it's, he's all the great. it's all the good stuff. It's all the good. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there, something's happening. <laughs> Kevin, we you, lost you right when you said, if you Google, and then it went away. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. If you Google double robotics um, and watch the video on the screen, you'll see this wonderful uh, promo reel. Um, I've had this thing for a few weeks now, and the darn thing is as good as the promo reel says. I've taken it to Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, now, if I've got this robot and I slide my iPad in it, right, you download the app, double robotics app, log into my robot, and drive it from your iPhone, your iPad. What? Um, yes. So I'm in Christchurch, New Zealand, and you're driving beside me downtown um, or doing staff development or, or, or you can look down and see your wheels because you put the iPad in upside down and there's a periscope what? to let you look down so you can swap cameras. <coughs> you turn around, you can get taller, shorter, and okay. it's like a um, segue for your iPad. It, it, it keeps itself upright. And when you park so we can it, buy one of these? You must have one. Um, I sale? have to have that. I have to have this. Have, yes, every school should have one, and I think um, I'll tell you how I think it might work. I've got mine in a school, and when I'm on the road, sometimes I take it with me, but I've embedded it in a school on purpose. And the teacher's there. This is Mount Hope Elementary, where my wife teaches. And I picked that school because I've got two teachers who are very willing to work with this thing. So as I go out in the world and meet amazing people, I can put them right in my wife's classroom. They can walk right in, cool. and they can be tall, they can be short. Um, I can also take the robot with me and let my wife's kids stand on the stage in Norway with me, or Christchurch, or Hong Kong, and they can see what it feels like to do a keynote, or I can take them out on the pier, or it's telepresence. It's not, you know, this is cool and everything, but you're flat, you know? Yeah. If you could walk right into this room, walk up to me, there's a certain rapport that occurs, especially with kids. <laughs> kids totally treat this awesome. robot like a person. Oh One yeah. One of the kids said, "Can we make a body for it?" And I said, <laughs> "Yes. We're gonna make a body out of styrofoam, put robot arms on it. But truthfully, it's just really a straight-up rod with wheels on the bottom and a place for your iPad. It's very simple. They've kept the price point down. Twenty-five hundred <clears throat> seems like a lot, but for a consumer robot, you know, that's, that's connectable, <laughs> voice over IP, connectable and controllable. You know, I think if you had a kid with long-term illness." Yeah. What if they could walk anywhere in this school and feel like they're there? So my service center here, guess what we're going to do? This is brand new stuff. All Let right. me unveil this. All right. All All right. Right. That's what we got we to get the scoop. We do probably 100 staff developments in this building every year. So you come here to ESDAC and you sit in a room and you get your staff development, which we love and we do it very well. But here's my problem. I'm all over the world. Um, I can't say go to ESDAC, please fly to Kansas for a one-day workshop. Now I can. You want to be one of our robots and get college credit and do one of our workshops? <laughs> you just move into the robot, drive down there. Think about this. Any school, any building that's ADA compliant, this robot can have free reign in. So it's like you're really there. You're controlling the robot as if it's you and you're just your face is on it. driving through an iPad. Your we face is on it. Um, and I've got video. If you look on my YouTube channel, we might put a link on there. You can see this thing driving around. Yeah, that is incredible. Link. Yeah, um, we need to send one to an ed camp or something. That would be so awesome. Wait, yeah, I think I, saw, <laughs> I think I remember seeing you put a, a link of this on Facebook when you were in uh, Christchurch. Right. That was cool because it kind of makes a point. I, I'd like to take it um, to New Zealand because that's pretty far away. And when I have a teacher from Ohio, and I did, Don Wetrick popped in. Kim Heron popped in, two teachers that I like a lot here in America, popped in during my workshop and walked around the room and interacted with people. And first it was weird, and then it was just like they were there. Right away, it becomes something different. And I think this is the next wave, this telepresence that's going anywhere. Uh, this is where I think it's going to go next. Um, so I'm putting some time into it and have invested in it. Um, and I'll keep you posted uh, on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, the classroom thing, I, that's what I... The first time we have a kid who can't come to school, who's out at recess via the robot, and actually having more fun than an online worksheet, that's a story Yeah, mm -hmm. worth telling. Or when we have three or four kids who've never been to our school and still attend there, 
and we get funding. Um, well, that's, drive that's, all over that's a life-changing moment. I mean, even just thinking about kids with those illnesses that have to spend large amounts of times in a hospital or anything like that, and the mm -hmm. fact that they would still be able to interact with their peers, even from a hospital bed, and not ever miss a day. I mean, the possibilities there are just incredible. Mm. See, right now I could get on my phone, log into that computer at my wife's school, and drive in, you know, drive into any classroom and uh, talk to her. So if I want to read a book to the kids at three o'clock, um, I just call the computer and uh, the robot, and uh, she knows I'm coming. And we've put a schedule online. Actually, uh, I'll, I'll give you guys a link when I'm done here for people to connect with the teachers. Say, hey, I want our classroom to connect to your classroom. Let one kid drive and put it on Apple TV so they can see the whole classroom and see what it looks like to to be taller and shorter and adjust yourself. I'm going to put a mirror up too so the robot can see itself so kids can see, oh this is my doppelganger. This is what I look like. <laughs> uh, kids seem to want it to have a shirt um, and so we're going to do that. I want, yeah, I want them to have rapport with it. Yeah, it definitely needs to have a a look for sure. Uh, the science teacher in me just thinks of a great lesson on like the the Mars rovers. I mean, God, well, you could do so many cool things with that. Just pretending it's a rover and and doing all kinds of cool lessons about that. Imagine to um, put a put a second iPad or a camera on it, and it's a cameraman, a remote cameraman. Mm -hmm. um, but you can drive anywhere or an obstacle course in the gym and have it takes. I would say an obstacle course and let kids practice, but it takes them literally 30 seconds to totally learn how to drive the computer. <laughs> drive the computer. Yeah. It takes it's the adults, adults that it takes longer. Yeah, yeah, it takes us a bit longer. My boss jumps into some of my workshops now when I'm somewhere and just walks around the room, talks to people. Um, um, it just feels like he's there. You know? So how big is this thing? Um, it's full height. It's probably 5'4". Oh, okay, and so it's a big, down, wow. It, it drops down about a foot and a half, and so it can be, you know, third grader height all the way up to junior high height. Um, wow. Yeah, and you just have a button on your phone where you just make it taller or shorter, just touch it once, and it goes down, goes up. Battery life has been great so far. I've never run out of juice yet. Um, your iPad will run out of power before the robot will. Wow, um, so cool. Yeah, I, so yeah, I, I, I want to play with this so bad. I want to see I, it. I, I want to like, have, have it in my class tomorrow. <laughs> so, I'm going to do a Donors Choose project. That's a, exactly. We need to do a team Donors Choose for that's our district. Right. Actually, yeah. I have a, another thought on that too. Donors Choose, yes. Or go to your Chamber of Commerce and find someone that sort of wants to sponsor and like a NASCAR, put stickers all over it hey. um, and let them buy it. Um, Waller Chris, feed I, store. I hope, you're, well, I hope you're taking notes, Chris, because uh, we're doing this. We're going to get this yeah. robot. I can see so the in barbecue the short term, restaurant. If you guys want to log in, I'll be at the school tomorrow, and I'll turn it on. And if you guys will download the Devil Robotics app, I'll give you the username and password for the robot and let you watch us make our solar cookers. <laughs> yeah, oh, my sure. gosh. I'm downloading the app right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So... Uh, we see. I saw you posted this week. You got a new guitar. I know. I know you bring guitar into a lot of the stuff you do, and I know you play mm -hmm. guitar. And I believe that you have a guitar right with I you do. there tonight. Yeah. So. Oh, convenient. So how, how do you How do you utilize the guitar, like in keynotes and in, um, you know, just professional development in the classroom? What kind, what kind do you? I mean, do you play for? Your own songs, or do you make up songs about <laughs> about the rock cycle, or what? How do you, how do you, what's it, what's yeah. it work? I always work my guitar into my teaching, especially at the elementary and some at the high school. I use my guitar to teach kids guitar at the high school and junior high, and to get them playing. Um, so it's always been a part of my teaching. Um, when I became a staff developer for a few years, I I never thought about it, and then I finally thought, wait a minute. <laughs> I shouldn't leave anything back at home. If I if there's something I can do, I should bring it to what I do, and then creativity becomes important again. And so, woohoo! I got a perfect excuse. <laughs> the truth is, I just want to play my guitar, and I'm busy all the time. And if I don't work it into my job, I'll never get to play it. Um, so, in staff development, of course, I play it as sort of infotainment, but to get kids excited, get teachers excited about the idea of letting kids create. I show them how to go to TuneCore, upload an MP3, and have a song on iTunes in three days, and how a kid could do that. And an audio, by the way, an audio book. Anything kids write can be an audio book, um, and that can be a product on iTunes. There's so many ways to let kids publish and to let them be validated and to get them wanting to do it again and again and again. Um, and I also play along while someone plays something on my iPad, and we have a traditional mini concert to show them how past and present, they go together. They always have. 
you know, so you're playing virtual drums on iPad. It sounds just like drums while I play an old school guitar. It's a good showstopper moment. I usually the last five or ten minutes of any presentation, I'm going to do something like that, a little a little jam session. It, you know, people like that. People want to feel like rock stars. Uh, nerds yeah, want to rock. Sure. That's right. And I show them apps and things they can do. When I have a whole day workshop, we really get into it. I've done some creativity workshops. You would not believe some stuff I've gotten away with. Um, the other day I had about 300 kids in this school here in Kansas, um, and I sent them all out. I said, you got one hour. Go create something. I don't want to see you again until you create something. I don't care what, but go create. Take a picture, draw a picture, make a song. They looked at me weird for a minute, and then they went. And they did it, and we posted on a hashtag, a hashtag create something now, um, exclamation point. Um, <laughs> and what I want to do is like that kind of ad hoc maker experience anywhere you go. Go write a poem. Go do something. Okay. Kids have forgotten how to create. In kindergarten, they knew how. And then they made bean owls and macaroni birds mm. and, and you know paint-by-number thinking so long they forgot they became divorced from their own creativity. It's hard to get it back, you know? And so I think we should try, since Create is at the top of Revised Blooms, I think we should at least give it a try. Um, so I want all teachers to think about letting kids create as a part of their learning, you know? Well, so I, write, yeah, I write songs as I travel. I write songs. Um, songs write me, actually. They sort of um, occur to me over time. Um, I'll get a tune in my head, and I'll start working on it and I don't rush it, and it kind of takes a long time. And I've got eight songs on iTunes. If you find me on iTunes, I would recommend listening before you buy. Some are good, and some are... <laughs> 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 They're all sincere, but some are, some are better than others. But I, I do that because if I'm going to tell kids to do it, I better do it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So I, you know, I'll risk being embarrassed um, for the sake of saying, come on, old man like me has got songs on iTunes. Where's your stuff? There well, great go. segue. Why don't you play us a little something? I was going to say, the take it, speaking of taking a risk here. <laughs> hmm. So let me see here. I think of something I should play, could play. You know, a lot of stuff that I learn, um, I learn on, um, on YouTube, of course, yeah. uh, because we all talk about how kids can learn on YouTube, and uh, shouldn't I? So yeah. um, I go on YouTube and I find songs that I've always wanted to play in the like the 80s, for instance. In the 80s, you know, I'm still in high school. I, I'm the son of a janitor. And we got no money. There's no guitar lessons happening in the Honeycut trailer. Um, <laughs> and there's no YouTube. So I'm kind of stuck. Uh, so I had all these songs I wanted to play from those bands back then. And now, finally, after all this time, I'm learning those things on YouTube. Like there's one um, called Hold On Loosely from 38 Special. Guess who I'm learning it from? Jeff Carlisi of 38 Special. <laughs> it's so cool. You know, so in my head, I would always imagine how to play this song. Now I'm just watching his hands, rewinding him over and over. That, that song is cool. He kind of stole that song from the cars. I mean, he liked this sound. This is, this is, a, this is a muted, like, snap rhythm. Can you hear that? Uh-huh. So he says that, right? He does this little drop like this. Know that one. I learned all from Jeff Jeff Carlisi, baby. That's the cool thing I can tell kids too. What are you learning? You know, what are you learning? Yeah. Now the person that's teaching you doesn't judge you. You can rewind them as many times as you want. So what's stopping you? I told the kids today, the only thing that can stop you is you. So go get better at something. You know, go right. learn how to do something. Um, I'll play a little piece of this song that I'm working on. This is one that I'm, I'm writing. It's really this is nothing, but I got it in my head uh, that I like the way it sounded. yet. Sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sounds great. When you pick it, I have in mind to do an intro, like kind of like this. Hold on. Darn it. 
Something like that. Anyway, I've been working on that for the better part of two weeks, and no words have come to me yet. I've been playing on planes. If you watch me kind of moving around the world, if I don't play in airports and planes, um, I'll never play. So, um, And that's why I'm saying, kids, man, don't stop. Don't stop. Keep working on it. Keep working yeah. on it. I told a kid today, he said, well, he had 15 reasons why he hadn't done it yet. I said, <laughs> shut up. Yeah. <laughs> First song published, and let me see it. And if it's embarrassing, make a better one. But stop talking. Anything between you and done, knock it down. <laughs> oh, Perfect is the enemy of done. Just get one done. You'll get better later, but stop giving me excuses. I told that to a kid I just met. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you're a, a connected guy. You're on social media. You're a connected Educator Month is coming up next month. And how important do you think it is today, you know, in today's world, to just be a connected educator? All right. So I'm going to preach a little bit here. All right. Let's go do ahead. It. Preach on. Preach I on. say. You know, people who who are self-contained are not going to be able to keep up with networked people. They're not. It's a it's a it's a change in order of magnitude from from Cro Magnon to Homo sapiens. People with a macro mind and the ability to leverage thousands of minds, uh, come on, it's an unfair advantage, and our kids deserve the same advantage. Teachers who are connected this way, come on, they bring all that power to kids. They are funnels of opportunity for their kids. They are self-directed learners. I believe in this idea of self-directed staff development. You don't have to sit there anymore and listen to an expert drone on for eight hours. You can go learn what you want when you want, and we should do that because we have to role model for kids that everyone should do that. If we're going to live in a world that changes this fast, we have to learn faster. Right. You know, and waiting for someone to tell you something isn't enough anymore. So, you know, you know how it is. If you're on Twitter, you ask a question to 20,000 people, you get a good answer if you build a good network. If you build a junk network, prune it. You know, if you're going to make wine, you need good grapes, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I tell kids, man, don't just collect everybody. Collect quality people. Why aren't you following your future college professors on Twitter? Follow the people who have the job you think you want. Stop, stop just doing puberty, and let's get intentional here. Our teachers do that. We go out and collect other teachers that we find important, that inspire us. Sometimes you just need to get through the freaking day. You just need to believe for four more hours so you don't kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you just need to be lifted up. Someone just says a nice thing and you think, wow, okay. That's what we do. We feed each other. You know, right. This is a hard job. This is a hard job. We're connected, man. It is an unfair advantage. That's why I want everyone to be connected. It's, it, it's not ego, man. It, it's strategy. Well, it's funny. It's because people always ask Chris and I where we're getting ideas or where we're getting this or that, and we just constantly tell them, you know what? Where it's not from people around here. It's from people that we meet online through like Twitter and stuff, where we are learning constantly from these amazing educators who are doing these incredible things that, had we not been connected, we would have never probably heard about. So, here's my question: When I burned out in the classroom, would that have happened if I'd been connected to ten thousand other teachers? <laughs> Todd, you can speak to that. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, it's funny you say that because I just wrote a blog post that came out on um, Monday that uh, was called uh, My PLN Saved My Career um, because last year was the, uh, the year, the, about a year and a half ago um, was when I got started on Twitter and I was ready to leave um, education. I did not want to be in it. It wasn't, I felt like I was a test teacher. I couldn't find my way out. I wasn't in love with what I was doing and I didn't feel like I had a network that was around me that was helping me grow and then getting active on Twitter and connecting with these incredible people who were inspiring me and supporting me and at the same time challenging me and pushing me on I mean that really did it was the only thing that kept me in education and reminded me of, of the power that I have and, and the creative things that I can still do see what is that worth you know I believe a teacher can have a renaissance anytime in their career they can become new again. I believe they can become new six months before retirement if they just get exposed to the right people. Right. And you know, by the same token, I think a really great teacher can burn out very quickly if they are a detached retina. If 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 they're they're giving water from their well and they're never getting any water. Right. Um, that's not healthy. And so uh, I'm I'm thrilled that that happened. Um, and knowing that that didn't happen for me um, makes me even more uh, insistent that teachers, especially the ones who feel isolated, 
under attacked, undervalued. Look, the nature of working somewhere is to be undervalued. No one where you work will ever appreciate you for how good you are. They're not allowed to. We're so fair, it's unfair how fair we are. <laughs> I love that. Well, no one can be special. That would be unfair, wouldn't it? Uh, so you're great at this and you're great at that. We can't delineate. And until we can do that for teachers, we won't be able to do it for kids either. What we need to be able to do is let people be individuals and love them and value them for being magnificent and stop getting mad if they dare to do something well. What in the heck is wrong with us that we... Right in the middle. Every time he's right at a good point. Like, just the... <laughs> I'm telling you, this is happening on purpose. It's just holding <laughs> court and it just like goes to hell. <laughs> Yeah, but I think we got to change this culture. And if we don't do it, who will? And if not now, <laughs> when? Yeah. Man. It's already been a long time. And we can't wait. And, you know, and every time I think we can wait, I remember our kids are waiting with us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, uh, the final question we always like to end on is, what is something that you are really passionate about right now? Oh, we got one stumper. We didn't lose him, those of you that are listening. Many, He's too thinking. many passions, that's the problem. Too many yeah, passions. Right. <laughs> it is hard. It's, uh, suddenly I went schizophrenic. Um, <laughs> trying to pare it down. Um, I think um, we have a moment here um, before we go right back to standardized testing, the way we've been doing it, uh, as we implement Common Core or whatever we're doing in place of No Child Left Behind, if we do that, um, to reframe this conversation. Everyone had an opinion in the heart of No Child Left Behind. We better have an opinion now on the onset of this, and I believe that teachers have got to rise up not to be anarchists. Um, we're experts. We do this every day. To have someone else tell us what to do when they don't even know what we do is wrong. Um, so right now I'm passionately telling every teacher to blog, to podcast, to tell your story, to make sure the world knows what we really are, and stop being quantified by people who don't or vilified. Um, look, we're going to have to we're going to have to create a revolution here. I think it's happening on Twitter. I think it's happening on Google Plus. I think it's happening in small bastions, but they haven't joined forces yet. You know, not really joined forces. And, and um, man, um, I feel that coming. And, and not, I think <laughs> education is either going to wait to be bypassed or it's going to wake up and reinvent itself on the ashes of what it was. And I don't want to fire anyone. I'm not out to get anyone. Um, I'm out to make sure our kids are ready for their future. Um, so I'm ready for us to, to move, to start talking with, with a more unified voice. There are things we can agree on. Kids need to be ready for their future. Teachers need to be connected in PLNs, to be connected to big networks of other people because we're understaffed, under-resourced, and over-challenged. Um, that all needs to happen. It's easy to agree with. No, teachers should be isolated and working in their own classrooms on laminated lesson plans <laughs> from a file cabinet. Um, I don't hear anyone saying that, at least not on Twitter. So <laughs> I guess the movement um, is kind of what I'm about more overarching. I talk about lots of things, but that's one thing I always push teachers to do. Well, Kevin, we want to thank you for coming on today with us. We really appreciate you giving us some of your time to sit and chat and um, hang out with you. Um, I know I, I've met you once before, and it was very briefly, um, but it's great getting to uh, really see uh, and learn more about you. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that are listening, uh, you can find us on Twitter at HQ. Um, hashtag is EduAllStars. We also have our website, eduallstars.com, and you can find uh, this and 15 other podcasts on uh, iTunes by just searching EduAllStars. And then we have uh, lots of great guests coming up, including the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, next Tuesday at 1 o'clock Central. You can register for that, and a reminder uh, at eduallstars.eventbrite.com. We'll put the link on our website as well. I also just want to encourage you to, if you, if you suck around this far, you know, go ahead and give us a rating on iTunes, if you, even if it's bad, whatever. Go ahead and get out there and leave some comments and let us know what we need to change or what, what we're doing really well. Um, really appreciate you coming on, Kevin, and uh, really enjoy hey, the conversation. Great get with Ar Arnie Duncan. Um, yeah, for sure. 
Only thing is, can you have me and him on at the same time? Kind of? <laughs> Believe me, you you're not the only one that wants to be there. How many requests? Exactly. <laughs> I, I, we still, we don't really. I mean, I don't think it's really hit us that he's really going to be on the show or that he even agreed. I think it goes back to our name of being Edu All Stars. That's how we got him. But how um, many? Hey, that's smart. How many of them offered you a double robotics robot for the opportunity? <laughs> exactly. And you know, we yeah, may that bring that up with Arnie and say, you know, our ask, last guest. We'll ask. Our last guest is going to let us borrow his robot. Can you buy <laughs> us a robot? <laughs> Are you going to let him one-up me? Fine. <laughs> Next time. That's right. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Kevin, and we will talk to you later. See you guys.